Our text this morning is the uh, gospel reading in Matthew 11. Um, I want to bring you verse 17 again. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. This is our text. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, those of you that know me have known me to speak about my mother occasionally. So it seems appropriate this morning for a moment. Uh, my mother says often, when she's speaking to us kids, she says, do your ears lop over. Now that doesn't sound like anything important, but what she means is, uh, don't you listen to what I say. If you, you know, if your ears lop over, you can't hear anything. That's what she's getting at. And of course, if you uh, are not hearing because you're not listening, that means you're not believing what she says. And then of course, the really bad part is you're not obeying what she said, and then all of the world collapses around your lopped over ears. So that's just what it's like in my childhood, I guess. All right, so <clears throat> what Jesus says here, or at least a part of what he says, is he who has ears, let him hear. <clears throat> now he's talking about what has been already spoken to these folks that are listening to him, uh, maybe not in the moment, but uh, also uh, in the Old Testament. So the, the, the very last prophet of the Old Testament is Malachi. And his very last words, the last paragraph of the things that he tells them, uh, is that Elijah will come. Now, uh, and, and if he comes and he can't get people to listen, to pay some attention and to change, then a great curse will fall upon the world. Okay, well, that sounds like bad news. Now here, uh, Jesus is saying that this Elijah guy that's supposed to come, which actually, even when Malachi said that, he was already long dead, but he's saying that John the Baptist is the spirit of Elijah, which is what you're supposed to hear today, that he's come that he has invited people to pay attention and to change what they're doing. Uh, that's what Jesus is telling them. So uh, there is danger in dismissing what a prophet says, obviously, because they speak for God. And if you don't pay attention, then they get upset or rather God gets upset, which is a kind of a horrible problem. Uh, and especially if you don't listen to the one who has come to announce the coming of the Messiah uh, is supposed to be preparing you, the people, for his coming. Uh, this is the Son of God that's about to make his appearance. And this is a prophet telling you that and asking you to go get baptized. That's what he presented with them. Uh, and if you're not listening to that, well, that's not believing that John knows what he's talking about. Uh, and in this case, what Jesus said about him. And then that means no repenting and also no rejoicing in the time of the coming Savior. All of that is just bad. So if you do attend to what John the Baptist said, even, you know, as we sit here today, you should get started repenting and bearing good fruit of repentance in life. Now, on the other hand, I, I would suppose if you're like most people, you probably figure you haven't been too bad in your life as things go on. So it, it works out that repenting is probably not the foremost in your mind to be doing. Why? You might even ask, is it so important if I'm doing okay? And isn't being pretty good about as much as anyone could reasonably expect from a human being? Because you know, perfection is not going to be on your list of things to do. Uh, and, and being pretty good is about as good as it gets. And that's all true except for a couple of problems. 
God, uh, God sent John the Baptist saying that it's not enough, that you need repentance, that you should be busy uh, producing f- fruit of repentance. And, and then uh, Jesus himself demanded perfection. Well, I mean, that's impossible for you, yes, but uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to go away. So how, how are you doing on, on your perfection? Probably not any better than your great fruit that you're supposed to have. So, uh, so uh, uh, do you hear this? Do your ears listen or do they lop over like my mother would say? Well, and if you do hear, uh, that's a problem. And of course, if you think it should be enough that you are pretty good, you may not be overly excited about being forgiven either. Because, you know, the, those two things go hand in hand. If you, you have to be concerned about what you're not doing before forgiveness even is relevant to anyone. So pretty soon, uh, 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 John and Jesus are not going to be real pleased by somebody thinking it's good enough. Jesus is not particularly kind in this part of scripture describing the people of his time. This generation, he calls them. But things haven't changed much since then. We are still human beings. We are still supposed to be the people of God. Uh, But as it turns out in this world, just in general, and it sort of runs into our lives too, people are not much concerned with repentance. Uh, John the Baptist or anything else in scripture is not very meaningful to most people in the world and and it infects us. It just seems like it's not a big concern. Uh, The argument for repentance holds little water for them and as it infects us all, uh, you don't particularly consider repenting a big deal unless you're here with an engraved invitation, which is what you get when you start looking at what our service is saying. Then you start to think about it because you know you need to think about it. It's one of the reasons why you really need to be here. And that's that's the dirge that uh, Jesus is talking about. It calls for mourning. Because, you know, as you're here, you uh, uh, are not going to be long before you start to hear that you have sin, that you're not perfect, that you're not even particularly good, that you need repentance pretty bad, and that you don't do that very well, and then death is coming on the other end of all this because the wages of sin is death. Well, that's pretty good reason for mourning. A dirge is a, is a well, it's a funeral song, uh, and, and uh, when you hear that, you're supposed to respond. Of course, if repentance is not calling to you, Uh, forgiveness in Christ's death, his presence, his resurrection may not be very urgent for you either. But all of that comes clearer when you find yourself here in this house, when you hear that Jesus has in fact died for you to forgive you, this is a serious thing as well. The heavens have been playing the flute of grace's mighty joy from the beginning. Because as soon as that fruit of the tree was eaten then sin was an issue and death was an issue and and so Christ is on the way and has been foretold for a long long time so that joy has been here anticipation of Christ's arrival has been here seeing him here in the flesh speaking these things I mean this is the same Jesus that we uh, wait for now, uh, speaking these things to these people and, and also to us, for us to hear, well, that's something to rejoice about. So uh, then there's, you know, if you want to add on to it, we still wait for his coming, which is also cause for joy. So the question is, where is your joy? Where's your joy worthy of dancing? I mean, some of you I'd kind of like to see dancing. It might be something for me to have some joy about too. Uh, But you understand that there is reason for that joy. 
He came to forgive you in his own blood. It's already happened. He knows full well how hard it is for you to hold on to his gifts in every moment. He knows, which is why you're here. He's called you here. His blood calls out to you by the Holy Spirit that lives in you to come and hear reason for mourning and reason for a great joy. You cannot hold on to him. So Jesus came into the world to hold on to you so that you would have life eternal and you have that promise from him. We wait for him to come and grant that to us all. He says wisdom is justified by her deeds. That requires a little thought. But ultimately, if you understand that Jesus is the wisdom of God in the world, in the flesh, salvation that God wants, that's his wisdom. Well, if that's the case, he means that the deeds of wisdom are him (laughs) saving you and many others, I suppose, over the centuries of the promise and the wisdom of God was Christ standing there in the flesh for these people to see. And he has come into the world so that you could see your salvation. He is the wisdom of God justified by the simple fact of your salvation. Wisdom has saved you. Christ has saved you. The wisdom of your heavenly father found that terribly important. And so he gave the life of his son to have you. Now, you know, you might wonder what's it got to do with Luther's Reformation. It uh, happened, kind of started slow and worked up to a, a mighty roar, but it happened because the church, such as it was at the time, had sort of uh, lost their legitimate mourning for sin and death. They were selling forgiveness for money, which is a little crazy. Uh, and, and they had forgotten that sin and death was a problem among the people of God, even in that forgiveness is what they needed to offer in Christ's blood and not in their funding. And they also had forgotten about the, the dancing that comes with the salvation joy that arises from the forgiveness. And the joy that people have about that, all of that was sort of set aside. So Luther noticed and went about trying to set it right. And he brought Jesus forth again in joy, I guess you would have to say, so that people would see the truth of things and rejoice in the salvation that Jesus is. Mourning in their sins, of course, but more than anything, the overwhelming and overpowering and abundant grace that God has set in the world for you so that he might have you home. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.